So chapter three, the network protocols and communications. This is for my fundamentals of networking or my intro to networking, depending on the course that you are in. So with that, we're going to be looking at how to explain the rules that are used to facilitate communication, explain the roles of protocols and standard organizations in facilitating the interoperability for communication, in this regard specifically network communication, and explain how devices on a LAN access resources in a small to medium sized network. So rules of communication, protocols and standards, moving data in the network, and that's where we'll be at. So first one, rules of communication. So what is communication? First, we have to have a source and destination. We have to have some way of sending over a media or medium to a receiver. Or another way to look at that is we have to have a way to encode the message, send or deliver the message, and decode the message. And again, there's going to be a message source and a message destination. For example, if you're talking to yourself, it could be you're the source, but you're also the destination. As opposed to if you're talking to someone else, the person that's speaking is the source and the destination is the other person. So how do we do this? First thing is we have to identify some rules. We have to establish a set of rules so that we can send and receive efficiently and effectively. So first, an identified sender and receiver must be identified. Who will be the sender? Who will be the receiver? We have to agree upon a method of communicating. Are we doing it face-to-face, -face, telephone, via letter, via email, versus smoke signal? Or I mean, it doesn't really matter the how or the method, as long as we agree upon the method. Next, what language and what grammar will we be using? Are we doing it in Chinese or in German, in French, in English? Both parties must agree to the common language. Next, what about the speed and the timing of delivery? How frequently will we actually send or receive our message? How fast will we send or receive it? Lastly, some type of confirmation or acknowledgement requirements. That way, if we are communicating, how can I confirm or acknowledge that you truly got it? So how we do that is we have a source which is encoded and then we transmit it over a medium. The receiver will receive it, decode it, and then it is delivered to the actual message destination. If we look at maybe formatting of a letter, all of this is predefined by a set standard. So things like source, destination, where the stamp is, all of this is specifically crafted. And this is called message formatting. So an overview of the segmentation process. Basically, size is a restriction. So we reduce the size of each envelope or package. That way, we can have a more manageable size. Each segment is encapsulated in a separate frame with the address information, and that will be sent over the network. At the receiving side, the messages will be de-encapsulated and put back together. So let's say, for example, our message is quite too big, so we break it up into three pieces. We send each individual piece over. And on the receiver side, we de-encapsulate the three packages, and then we put them back together so that we can have our message again. Other ways for us to do uh, message timing could be an access method, flow control, or response time. And again, this is going to deal with the timing of our messages. Delivery options. We have three different types unicast, multicast, and broadcast. So broadcast is one to all. Multicast is one to many. And unicast is one to one. 
Moving on to our network protocols and standard. So the rules that govern our communication, normally there's, in this general idea, there's a content layer, a rule for communicating layer, and the actual physical layer, how it's sent. Content will be the content, the rule layer is the rules that are being used. Common language, who's going to uh, communicate first, and how do you take turns, and how are we going to signal when we're done? So these network protocols are formatted or structured in a very specific manner. The process by which the network device is the information and pathways with the network is one way. How and when errors occur and how the systems and the system messages are passed between the devices, as well as the set of determination of data transfer sessions when need be. So certain protocols we need to look at, HTTP, TCP, IP, and other network access protocols at the data link layer. So what is HTTP? HTTP is Hypertext Transfer Protocol, used on port 80, but it's used to send unencrypted web traffic. TCP stands for the Transmission Control Protocol, and it's connection oriented, so it's guaranteed delivery. Next is the Internet Protocol, that deals with the IP and addressing. And there's other network access protocols such as the data link and the physical layers and the, the different protocols that actually operate at those levels. So our TCP, some of the upper uh, data ones are going to be HTTP, DNS, DHCP, FTP. All right, so let's get a pin out. So this should be layer one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So one and two make up our Ethernet, our PPP, our frame relay, ATM, and wireless LANs. Layer three is all about IP and ICMP. Layer four is about TCP and UDP. UDP is our connectionless oriented uh, version of TCP. Again, best effort, not so much guaranteed delivery. So the creation of the internet as well as the development of TCP, first network, ARPANET, in the late 60s, uh, funded heavily by the DOD. It was used by universities and research laboratories so that you could share research. In 73, TCP was developed by the next generation of the ARPANET. TCP was designated to replace ARPANET's current uh, network control program known as NCP. In 78, TCP was divided into two protocols, TCP and then IP. Later, other protocols were added to the TCP slash IP suite of protocols, including things like Telnet, FTP, DNS, and Code lowered order uh, of others. So different layers have different protocols like ARP. ARP is going to be dealing with the bottom two layers. IP is going to be at the layer three or the internet layer. Transport layers, TCP and UDP, and the rest are application specific. So what about open standards like IANA or ITU or what does ITU stand for? I believe ITU is the Information Technology Union and it should be a European Union. The Union of International e Telecommunication, ITU, or International Telecommunications Union. Uh, we have the Internet uh, Architect Board, we have the Internet Engineering Task Force, IEEE, ISO, the ISOC, IANA, IATIA, ICANN. These are all different organizations tasked with making sure our growth of the internet is stable and functional. So 
so is there some type of structure to these yes there is so the internet society controls things like the iab the iab makes up things such as ietf or the internet engineering task force or the internet research task force and so forth things like ieee is it's 300 or not 300 38 societies 130 journals 100 uh, or sorry 1300 conferences each year 1300 standard projects 4000 members 160 countries and they developed two very spe uh, specific technologies 802.3 we know as ethernet and 802.11 which we know as wi-fi also things like 802.16 which is our WiMAX. ISO is our OSI model and ISO is the International Standard Organization is one of them. We also have IA and TIA, ITU, ICANN, IANA. ICANN is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. IAN is namely about, uh, dealing with the sign number authority. So let's get back into that layered model, that OSI model. So how does this help with network connectivity? And the nice thing here is everything is categorized and organized in such a way for easy troubleshooting. The layers are application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, visible. So application is layer seven, Presentation is layer 6, session is layer 5, transport is layer 4, network is layer 3, data link layer 2, and physical layer 1. And you want to know what protocols happen in each layer because later on this becomes extremely useful. That way if you know you're having a HTTP issue, you know you're dealing with the layers 5, 6, and 7. Here is our reference model again. Application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and physical. Here we have a TCP IP reference model, very similar to the OSI. And here they combine the layers 7, 6, and 5 into one application. Transport's the same, internet's the same. Here they also combine network access which in the OSI model is both the physical and data link. Here they are compared and again very similar. So let's talk about moving data in the network. So first let's talk about segmenting message benefits. Again different conversations can be interweaved uh, better with the reliability and better with efficiency and all that good stuff. Disadvantages makes it things more complicated. So how do we call the items that take place at each layer? For example, if we're dealing with layers 5, 6, and 7, that envelope or that package is called data. When that data gets down to layer 4, which is the transport layer, it's now a segment. When it goes to the network layer, it's now called a packet. When it's called to the data link layer it's a frame when it gets to the physical layer it should just be bits so here we go they're incorporate uh, actually encapsulating all right so here is our layer four five and six here's our layer four which engulfs the data Here's our layer 3, and here's our layer 2 and 1. The reason I do circle is because as you uh, take any envelope out of the circle, the envelope still has a circle around it. So protocol D encapsulation, same thing. So accessing a local resource. First thing is we need to have things like the physical, which deal with the timing and synchronization. 
the data link, which will be the destination and source, physical address, the network is going to be our logical addresses, both source and destination. Transport will be the destination, source ports, and numbers. And then lastly, the upper layers will be the encoding of the application data. So communicating with devices, we have a destination MAC and we have a source MAC. So if we're dealing with just things that are local, we are never getting the IP header. But the second we are trying to get outside of being local, we're going to strip off the data link completely and probably package a new one on. MAC and IP address. If you're not sure of the MAC address or the IP address of your neighbor, you can actually send an ARP request and that will allow you to get the MAC address. Here we're looking for who has what information. So they should uh, get, they probably will do a broadcast to try to find the appropriate default gateway. And again, the appropriate default gateway is the IP address leaving to the router. Or another way to say that is the IP address of the router that we're going to. Because again, until it gets to a router or other layer 3 device, it's not leaving the network. Here, if we are going from one PC to a web server, the MAC address will actually be completely removed and they will actually put the MAC address of the router once it leaves. But as we're getting to our router, the destination should be the router's address. And I believe that is it for this chapter. I want to thank you and hope you have a great day.